Hi, I'm Abby. I'm the Chair and Outreach Director for PLEA, which is Patient-Led Engagement for Access. Thanks so much for listening to Professionally Cannabis. Where do they go? The smoke rings I blow each night. Oh. Hello listeners and welcome to another episode of the Professionally Cannabis Podcast. I'm your host, Oscar Hausman, and with me is my co-host and good friend, Jonathan Weiser. Jonathan, how are you doing today? I am doing very well. I do like the interchange between Jonathan and Johnny between our different podcast episodes. I feel like it keeps our listeners waiting and getting to see which it will be this week. I love the I love it when you say Jonathan. So thank you very much, Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> I know you do, which is why it's so hard for me to remember not to say Johnny when it used to be that for the last 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. God, don't remind me how... Don't let the listeners know how old we are. We could still be young by our cartoon portraits. <laughs> 16 years young. No. Um, anyway, 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 anyway. I am really stoked for the episode that we have today. It's with someone that we know very, very well. Uh, Oscar, who? Who did we speak with for today's episode? We spoke with Abby Hughes, the chair of PLEA. Patient-led engagement for access. A real big hitter in the scene of cannabis advocacy, patient advocacy that is, and reform in the UK. She's, and I mean, I don't really want to give away what goes on in the interview, but she's got a wonderful story comparing about how five years ago she was outside Parliament, three years she was inside, two years ago they were changing the rules. Anyway, it's it's to be enjoyed in the context of the interview. But needless to say, Abby was a wonderful guest who has got a great knowledge about medicinal cannabis in the UK and opened up to us about what it's like as a patient, what's changing as new programs such as 2021 come online, and also uh, gives us a little bit about her theory on revolution or reformism. It was a lovely episode. I really enjoyed it. Listeners, we hope you do too. It gives me great pleasure to welcome to the pod Abby Hughes, who is the chair of Patient-Led Engagement for Access, or PLEA for short. Formerly of the United Patients Alliance, Abby has been a medical cannabis campaigner for many years now, leading initiatives to help the wider public see that cannabis isn't the devil's lettuce and working with the industry to give a true patient's perspective. She's someone I know very well and we are delighted to welcome her onto the show. Abby, welcome to the Professionally Cannabis podcast. Oh, thank you, Jonathan. That was a very nice introduction. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really pleased to be here. I am a listener of the podcast, so it's great to now uh, be welcome to be a guest. Thanks so much for having me. Lovely. Great to have a listener become a guest. It feels a bit, um, I don't know, the circle of the podcast life. So you'll know what question I'm going to be asking you then, Abby, which is, of course, what led you to the plant? So for me, it wasn't so much the devil's lettuce as Nanny Carol's herbal tea, uh, I guess, when I was younger. My nan used cannabis, and for us as, as sort of kids and teenagers, we sort of knew she used it, but we didn't. It, to us, it was almost seemed like alcohol or tobacco as nan's thing she used it but then as we got a bit old we understood about helped her with arthritis and pains and she used it all of the time she used to go and visit Jamaica and all sorts of things bless her so I guess for me my interest in cannabis did stem recreationally as a teenager I think that's not an uncommon thing to hear and as I grew older I'd sort of grown out of that and I grew ill you might say I, I got sick I was diagnosed in 2012 with a condition called endometriosis, which is where the lining of your womb migrates. There's, you imagine what happens. There, there is a shedding of the lining of your, your womb. The same happens with these cells that migrate elsewhere. And there's nowhere for that blood to go. You end up with scarring and adhesions, really bad abdominal pains, digestive issues, all sorts of gut issues, and really quite a lot of chronic pain, particularly when you're menstruating. And to me, I was being prescribed lots of different opiates and such and different pain things started off with naproxen and the lower things then often things like gabapentinoids until I ended up actually seeing a pain specialist 
it turned out I actually have a genetic tissue disorder, a connective tissue disorder, which is called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, where you, I think it's where you don't produce collagen correctly is the, the long and short of it. And that means I'm, I'm hypermobile, which means I'm double jointed. I never knew. <laughs> Quite bendy. But then that has an impact on everything in your body, your autonomic nervous system, your gastrointestinal system. Everything is bothered by that because your collagen is faulty. Your Everything's lax. Your joints don't do the hard work. That means your ligaments are left to do that. So I have now ended up having multiple surgeries after having multiple medications And I actually managed to get myself off all of these medications through understanding more about cannabis and using it in a way that's beneficial to me. So whereas when I used to use it recreationally many years ago, I might have a a joint here and there or whatever. But now it's very much I understand cannabis. I understand the endocannabinoid system and I understand how to use cannabis to help me so sort of have a routine with it and I try and understand what strains I have. I'm fortunate now to have a prescription for cannabis which we can talk about in a bit but it came about for me being given a cocktail of drugs where ironically I was off my face on drugs. I was a manager in the NHS at this time trying to better my quality of life but being given all these different drugs that were just making me almost incapacitated. I lost my creativity and my sense of humour. I became a shell of a person and it wasn't even making me well. I was barely able to function. It was numbing me in, in that essence, dulling the pain, but not managing my symptoms. Whereas now I've managed to come off all of those medications and I'm using solely cannabis. I've ended up very much working in cannabis advocacy because of those experiences. Um, It's something I'm really passionate about. And that I, I feel there's just not enough knowledge and education about. So I guess it stemmed from Nanny Carol and it's moved all the way on to being my life now to advocate for medical cannabis and to allow other patients to share their stories, you know, and, and to help create a patient centered industry. You know what? I think you're one of the first people we've had on the podcast who's had direct experience working in the NHS, something that just struck me now. And as someone with a prescription, how do you see the patient experience melding with the NHS? Because, I mean, it's been an uphill battle for patient access, sorry, for many people. So you've probably got a unique ability to see what, what it looks like from an NHS point of view and also from a patient point of view. Yeah, fortunately, I think uh, I did about 10 years in management in the NHS. So I've seen the ins and outs of of how things work, how they progress, how we work with different stakeholders, um, NHS England and NICE and all the different challenges that the NHS faces in terms of that. I've also dealt with specialised commissioning and lots of unlicensed medicines. So it's funny now that I've managed to take what I in effect did in secret when I worked in the NHS because I couldn't, I didn't have a prescription at that time. And now I've managed to transfer those skills I had in the NHS to actually saying, well, hey, hang on, we should be talking about cannabis and the endocannabinoid system. I guess when I worked in the NHS, I used to say, oh, professor oncologist, have you seen this study on the endocannabinoid system that this professor in America has done, for example? They would end up coming back to me with questions. Oh, have you seen this? Did you know that? Because I'd pretend I didn't know anything about it. But what I do know from the NHS perspective is as much as I fully support growing your own, I think patients should have the right to grow a plant. It's just the plant. I don't have my own poppy fields to grow opiates. So the reason that plea focuses on legal access through mainstream healthcare is because of the way that the guidelines and the processes work. I don't think it's likely that the NHS are going to turn around and say, okay, we understand your point. Now everyone grow and grow, and grow cannabis. We'll grow it on the rooftops of all the hospitals. Although I have got a plan for that, which we'll talk about maybe in another <laughs> podcast. <laughs> um, so my perspective is they're not growing your own isn't going to be a, a feasible way of obtaining medicine right now at this point in time, because it's not realistic. It's not something that the NHS is going to allow. And I understand why not. But what we can do is is support things that the NHS does support. So I used to manage things like 
um, a bariatric registry. We were the first bariatric centre of excellence in Europe, in fact, through implementing peer review recommendations and, and a multidisciplinary team function through essentially weight management. And I very much see cannabis can mirror that. So patients try different medications that haven't worked and then they try the cannabis in, in place of the bariatric surgery. And then their data is put onto a registry and those registry, the data from that registry is used to inform commissioning, i.e. it's going to be more cost effective to treat patients with bariatric surgery than to let them carry on being at the BMI and with the comorbidities that they have. For example, diabetes, sleep apnea, hypertension, those sorts of things have proven to be reversed through bariatric surgery, if done in tangent with a healthy lifestyle as well. And that's the model that the NHS uses for things like that. Cancer has a registry. Data from that registry is used for research, of course, but then also for commissioning. What sorts of things should we fund based on what sorts of data we are getting through the registry. So this is why PLEA supports Project 2021 as an observational study, because that's looking at patient reported outcomes, real lived experience by patients through means that are real to them. Um, it's not just about pain, for example, it's about your entire quality of life. And that to patients is often more important. I was part of a multi-criteria decision analysis earlier this year, which the this the report from this should be out hopefully by the end of the year, run by Drug Science, where we com- we charted different neuropathic pain drugs, all the different neuropathic pain drugs, and then we put onto that chart cannabis and where cannabis would sit in terms of the positives and negatives, if you like, the side effects and the things that it was good at like helping with anxiety and, and helping with eating and sleeping and such. And what I will say is we, everyone after we'd finished the session was surprised at where cannabis sat. And not, it's really important that patients were involved in that. It's the first time in an MCDA setting that patients have been invited to be included in the model for looking at, at medicines. And that was really exciting, actually, because to me, that's the way that healthcare is progressing. And we have to work with that. Don't hate the player, hate the game, if you like, and all that jazz. And we, <laughs> we have to work with what we've got and why we have this system where the NHS is saying we need more data. Um, it's not enough. It has all these bad, bad effects. Well, actually, this is where things like Project 2021 will come in to say, well, OK, it might not be for everybody, but this is who it does work for. And this is how we could implement it safely. Having that realistic expectation on how cannabis is going to be implemented as a medicine. I almost would like to see like cannabinoidologists because we have an endocannabinoid system, right? So people who are studying the, the ECS, that could be quite different to someone who's a general like rheumatologist or things like that. And Or will people studying the ECS, will that become part of a rheumatologist's role, for example? And that's what I'm excited by in the future. How is this going to fit and this is why plea want to make sure that the patient voice is centered in all of these conversations thanks as well for having us along to gci um to global cannabis intelligence because i know from feedback from not only the panel i joined but some of the panels that others have been joining that we're all really excited and pleased to have such patient involvement with gci because we don't always get invited along to share our voice. And that's why we've had to sort of make our own space and make our own voice in this arena. Hey, well, look, with, with regard to that, you are more than welcome. Um, You know, for me and my team at GCI, obviously Oscar is with another organisation, but for me and my team at GCI, you know, we really think it's super important that the patient's voice is not just heard, but is involved in those conversations with the the other stakeholders who are who are shaping the future of this industry and of you know the medical products that patients like yourself will have access to and I I guess with with that in mind could you give our listeners a bit of a flavor as to the work you guys are doing with plea and indeed sort of a little more insight into plea sort of where did it come from What, what do you do who are members who do you represent absolutely so we recognized earlier this year that we really needed to move into the non-profit space and be registered under the non-profit regulators 
and be taken seriously. Yeah, we're patients, but we are professionals as well. As mentioned, I was a manager in the NHS for 10 years. And although I'm a medical cannabis patient, I still am my own person. And I think sometimes people put patients in the category like you're just a patient. We have had, and I quote, people say, oh, and they've been interviewed and I've watched other people's interviews about why they've set up their organisations. And it's, oh, we've seen these poor patients fighting and they shouldn't have to do it. So, you know, we'll do it for them. (laughs) Which, like, don't make me laugh. We don't need you to do it for us. We are more than capable. Thanks very much. If you want to help, come join us. (laughs) We want to be taken seriously. We don't just want to get high. We want to be well. And where we haven't been taken seriously, it's given us a real drive to say, okay, well, how can we change this? Right, let's set up a community interest company to represent not only the patients, but the doctors, clinicians, researchers, academics, all the people involved in this industry. Because that's what it is. It's become an industry. And I think the people running the industry side of it often forget that they only have an industry because there are patients involved. So we're here trying to tie together the industry with the doctors, clinicians, researchers and patients so we can all work together to create an ethical, sustainable and patient-centred industry. And that's actually the title of one of our panels because we are super, super excited to have just announced our Medical Cannabis Awareness Week. And Medical Cannabis Awareness Week is the first in the UK, and we think it's the first in the world. We've had a look and we can't find anything else like this. So yeah, Medical Cannabis Awareness Week 2020. We are collaborating with people from across the sector to share our plea, which is essentially we want fairer access to cannabis medicines. We want education around cannabis for all. And we really want to see a shift in dynamic. We want to take these conversations out of the cannabis space because very much it needs to be spoken about, not just where there's already a knowledge of cannabis and there's people supporting each other to learn, but actually in spaces where people aren't talking about this at all, we want to drop that C-bomb and say, hey, look, this is real and this needs to be taken seriously and this is what we want to achieve and this is how we're going to achieve it. So through the awareness week people are invited to share a 15 to 30 second clip whether that's an audio or video clip or a little uh, a paragraph testimonial about what is their plea so actually jonathan and oscar you could both i'd like to take this opportunity to invite you both to submit a plea i'll send you the link over afterwards you can go on a medicalcannabisweek.org.uk and there is a link to upload upload your plea. And uh, there will be some examples put on there soon for other people that are interested. So those can be submitted in advance and throughout the week as well. And this will, again, not just from patients, but from everyone involved. What is your plea? What would you like people to know and understand about medical cannabis? And we're asking people to write to their MPs as well, um, as well as engage and learn. We have so many events from a patient's chat with Mary Biles. We have drug science doing an event on building the evidence base. Primary Care Cannabis Network and and CPAS are doing an event on discussing cannabis with your healthcare professionals. And the MCCS are doing an event on how to prescribe cannabis. MedCan ID, I've got a life with a prescription. CanCard are looking at ending criminalisation of medical cannabis patients. We've got patient-led gentle yoga. There's such a variety of different things going on. And there's there's lots more as well. So sorry if anyone's listening. I haven't just plugged your event. But have a look on the website because there's so many things happening. And we are so stoked that so many people have wanted to get involved. We thought about having Medical Cannabis Awareness Day. And then we were like, oh, we need a whole week. But now we're like, oh, maybe next year we'll have a whole month. <laughs> because there's just so much going on and so much interest. And all of those sessions are going to be patient facilitated as well or parents of patients, carers of patients, um, to really, and these are all going to be forums for discussion and for change and for action, not just all coming to a webinar, watch and then leave. We really want to create a forum to engage and actually make things happen. So really excited that that's going on and really proud actually of, of the team for pulling this all together. We've had loads of people go comment and go, oh, I didn't know we had a week and we were saying, well, we didn't. So we've made one and now we do. So we've been <laughs> Well, we'll definitely be making our pleas uh, online at that website. And 
perhaps in the description we can also leave a link so any of our listeners if they want to get there can also find it one thing i wanted to ask you abby is about your involvement with a different organization and this is project 2021 so we had david badcock on the pod just before the whole operation got off the ground. And now that it's running and patients are receiving uh, medications, there's a few products available. I, I know it's still early days. I wonder if you could give a little insight or a, a, li a little paint a picture of how it's working for our listeners. Absolutely. Um, Project 2021 is super exciting. They only launched in August and there's been so much interest already. There's, of course, teething issues. There's always going to be with things. But those things are being ironed out. And actually, there's so many people saying how life changing this has been for them to receive medicine, to be taken seriously, to get it delivered. People are now signing it for like a MedCan card to go with their prescriptions and to have that sort of safety net of like being able to say, yeah, I'm part of an observational study using med medical cannabis to help me better my quality of life. That's fascinating. And the only issues are around people, um, for example, working or driving and not being sure whether to, to touch on the, on the DVLA or to disclose to their work still. So I think T21's a bit of a way to go in terms of normalizing this still and supporting patients to be able to use their medications. I freely will go and sit outside Birmingham New Street train station. If I get off a train and I need to medicate, I'll sit there and I'll medicate. And I haven't had any issues whatsoever. But yeah, I'll go back to T21 because I'm going on a tangent now. <laughs> yeah, it's exciting that so many clinics are involved, that different products are starting to appear as well. So at the moment, there is um, a bit of a restriction on the number of products, but that's because it's such early days. But the, the reports that people are, are having and the data that's already starting to come back, because there is a little bit of, of data already for the three month follow up for some patients, it's essentially looking positive. I can't say much more than that because it's <laughs> not my information to disclose. Um, yeah, it seems like people initially were quite sceptical. There were a lot of challenges to get the ball ro rolling and to get things off the ground. But now that things are happening, more and more people are sort of having faith in the process and saying, oh, OK, well, my friends tried that. I'm going to go for it now. So it's really exciting that so many people are are able to get this help and drug science are working on a few more things to do with the projects which which they'll be announcing to help even more people soon so yeah it's really exciting times and, and we're really excited that we get to be involved in this as sort of patient consultants if you like. I'm going to ask a slightly loaded question insofar as the fact that I'm almost certain that I know the answer to this but how important is it to you and patients to be able to access your medicine legally, to have a prescription to, for everything to be above board and to not feel like you're being criminalised for just wanting to be more healthy? I think that's a, a big thing and a lot of people don't, don't understand the pressures of being a patient who is illicitly obtaining medicine, particularly for people with children or working in jobs where there might be drug testing or living in social housing and things like that. There's lots of blockers as, as to why patients are, are sort of stuck and find that really difficult. So being able to have a legal source, actually, it's life changing for people. We've had lots of people joining our patient working group and our forum who are now only able to come out and tell their story because they have a legal prescription. So it does seem at the moment that our forum has quite a lot of people in it with prescriptions, but I think that is because a lot of people only feel able to come out and join a forum and talk about this once they have a legal option. For some people, medicating illegally isn't even an option. So some people just won't try it. We've got a handful of patients now who are waiting on their prescriptions to be delivered or waiting for their consultations to get a prescription. And they haven't tried cannabis before because they have children, because they work in the NHS. And for those people, I'm not saying cannabis is going to save their lives, but I'm really excited to see how they get on with their new medication. Because for me, someone who's used it for a long time and I've managed to figure 
myself, what I think I need. And now I've had something in the form of a legal prescription. Actually, it was a life changer because my insomnia totally curbed. My eating got better. I was actually eating food and eating breakfast like in, like you're supposed to. <laughs> um, I was going to the toilet properly. All these things were actually my EDS slows everything down. Cannabis always, always puts it in the right place. But when I was using it from the black market, sorry, when I was using it from the illicit market, I found that my insomnia was still rife because half the time I didn't know what strains I was accessing. So I'd be having something that would help with my pain of an evening, but then I'd almost be wired and it would make my insomnia worse. It would my ADHD go ping instead of actually calming me down. So now I've found a strain that I'm prescribed, which is a consistent supply. It's tested so I know what's in it and it gets delivered through my door. That to me has been a total game changer because my insomnia is now almost like reverse. I'm actually at a real point and there has been a point in the project where my meds didn't come and that was awful and that was a teething problem and hopefully that's resolved now and it won't happen again. But that dip in not having my medications, just mind-blowingly difficult and I don't think that that's been understood, that when someone has access to something and then it's sort of taken away and you reverse and you go back into all this these abhorrent symptoms and just not being able to sleep or eat when you've just got used to that, this is the only thing. So I think there's just a couple of teething issues to make sure that there's the consistency, the continuity of care with medicine. And it's only been, I haven't heard many problems, but there have been a couple. And that's the only thing really is that, the importance of having access to the same thing because like I say on the illicit market if they could tell me it was anything and who knows what it actually was yeah it's just different isn't it to access something where you know what it is consistently compared to randomly getting something off the local (laughs) the local dealer that that all sounds quite I I feel like I, I I get a positive energy when you describe this story some patients or pati- or people that I've spoken to since the law change in 2018 are angry and things haven't changed enough. Do you think with Project 2021 and things changing, there is more that's shifted for patients in 2020, oh, even though no laws have changed, than in 2018? Yeah, absolutely. For me, it actually came up on my news feed five years ago yesterday, I think it was. I was at Parliament outside parliament talking to a crowd about drug policy reform a couple of years on from that Mm. i'm invited in parliament we are now working with the stakeholders to discuss these things 2018 comes the law is changed and things have been rocky things haven't progressed enough nowhere near enough but they have still progressed and i always put it like this we need to get across the pond fine. How you choose to get across the pond is up to you. How I choose to get across the pond is up to me. And I'm happy with the stepping stones that have been put in place so far. Not There's not enough. I still want to get to the other side of the pond, but it's a bit far for me to swim. I'm not a strong swimmer. So I'm going to go with the stepping stones that I've put in place. And I'm going to keep putting down my own stepping stones. Plea, I've got our own stepping stones. Medical Cannabis Awareness Week to us is a huge stepping stone. We hope that will have a big influence. And if people don't want to step on those stones, that is fine. They can wait at the side of the pond or they can put their own stones in place. That's cool. And yeah, the law hasn't changed enough, but hey, the law's an arse. We know that. So this is why we're doing things (laughs) to challenge it and to challenge the inequalities in access. And as I said earlier, the, the game is crap, you know. I want to vote for policies I believe in, not red or blue, but actually... I want to vote in things I believe in, but sadly, the way the world works is there are two parties and that and that's that. So you go with your heart and you pick based on who you want to support things because ultimately, if you don't pick and try and do something, then you're not making a change, are you? If you're just going to moan about it and not actually go in and place your vote or place your stepping stone. It's like, yeah, people were saying there's been no progression reminds me of people who don't vote. But that might be really harsh. Don't know whether that's a bad thing to say. <laughs> but it's not been enough. There are still sick people. There are so many children out there who are unwell. There are people dying because they don't have access 
to this medication and it's not enough but there has been progression and we can't deny that because I think that's foolish to say oh it's not enough there should be more well duh we know there's not enough we know it needs to be more but we just have to sort of tread carefully around that because as I mentioned earlier about the NHS and stuff there are processes in place and the only thing that would totally overhaul of all of this is a revolution so email me on abby at no i'm only joking but if you do want to have a revolution just let me know i'm in but <laughs> it will yeah, be televised yeah, totally <laughs> yeah and abby as our time on the pod unfortunately draws to a close perhaps one of the last questions that i'd like to sort of put to you and that is wearing your level-headed pragmatic hat which you wear all the time and which is a, a credit to yourself and understanding the environment that we're in in the UK in terms of access in terms of policy in terms of education what do you think would be the most natural and palatable next step in terms of policy change well fortunately for you that hat is back from the dry cleaners I would say two things. Firstly, Medical Cannabis Awareness Week to get that education out there in the different avenues and try and make people aware of this outside of the cannabis space for one. So that the next step, which is the bigger thing, really, I just have to get that plug in there, <laughs> is <laughs> looking at rescheduling to Schedule 4. Sativex is a Schedule 4. So what are we doing in Schedule 2 with the rest of cannabis? How does that work? I'm not sure how we get to Schedule 4 or what the plans are or the process, but that's something in my mind, and I can't speak for plea, but that's something we've been discussing is around Schedule 4 and do we go for that as a, as a sort of campaign in future? Because realistically, being sat in Schedule 2 is just blocking, or they we are told there is not enough research will allow us to do the research then. So we'll have to have a think about that. But in my mind, that's the next logical step is to put cannabis into a realistic schedule. No one's ever died from it. Let's be real about this and take the evidence that we do have to be able to reschedule it and actually start doing some more research, producing some more data to support patients to access this life changing medicine. Absolutely. Patients should be able to access this life changing medicine. And I hope if there's one thing that our listeners take away from this episode, it's that. That it's not just a fad. It's life-changing and it's here to stay. Abby, you've been a wonderful guest. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's been really lovely to chat with you. Cheers. Well, listener, we hope you enjoyed that interview with Abby. We truly think that the patient perspective is an incredibly important and pertinent one to hear, especially if you are a listener who also operates within the cannabis industry, which we imagine most of you are. So thank you for tuning in and we really hope you enjoyed Abby's interview. And Oscar, if our listener did enjoy Abby's interview, what would you recommend that they do? Well, I think it's no exaggeration to say they should use the prehensile thumb that evolution has graciously granted them, flick over their phone, or perhaps they're listening on their computer, in which case they may use other digits, click a like button, or perhaps depending on their podcast app, a three star out of three star, or even a five out of five. But either way, they must express digitally their joy for the podcast and share it with others so that it may continue to grow and grow and embiggen itself until all the world knows that Professionally Cannabis is the podcast that doesn't run out of steam at the end of its outros ever, even when it looked like it might do just then. <laughs> so in summary, please like, share and subscribe if you like the pod and <laughs> we will see you next time. Thanks for listening. Oh, please take me above. Take me 